Now, so far we've talked about the sort of helpful, benign uses of pointing, but there's a there's a chapter in the book which is is actually very funny, where you talk about the way that pointing can be used to assert the self, an expression of arrogance or uh, of someone who's very opinionated. And clearly, you've in your career you've come across a few people who've <laughs> who've known who've known how to exercise their index fingers as a sort of means of authority. Yes, I'm sorry if my allergy to certain kinds of pointing shows up in a certain amount of passion. Uh, I don't like people who wag their finger. I don't like people who say, mark my words, I'll say this only once, listen up. I don't like people who point to their own lips to tell you to be quiet. I don't like people who just raise their finger to tell you, please listen to me. Pointing is really quite a, an aggressive, sometimes an, an aggressive form of non-linguistic communication. When you're pointed at, you can sometimes feel you're actually being skewered and I think um, that can be extremely uncomfortable. And then when people are sort of prodding the air with their fingers, it's like a sort of digital glare. Uh, and sometimes one finger pointing can be more upsetting and discomposing than a curled fist. The example which I like best in your book of that was a committee chair who used to speak with her eyes closed and a, an index finger raised. That seems like an almost impermeable armor, really. That, that was unbearable, um, particularly she didn't seem to be on top of her brief, and we all had to sit around while she spoke at great length, as it were, holding the conch, um, <laughs> and as you say, with her eyes closed, which indicated that she was concentrating very hard on her thoughts, and not at all on the people around her. Now, I think a lot of people will be very persuaded by what you say about the, the role of pointing in, in, in human culture, but you talk about transcendence, which I suppose is, is the, sort of the sort of furthest claim that you make for the importance of pointing. So can you say a bit about how, how the index finger connects to this, this idea of, of transcendence and, and something beyond? Yes. I mean, for me, transcendence is something every day. It isn't about a deity in the sky or mystical experiences. It's about the extraordinary fact that we're aware of a world that goes beyond our experiences. We're aware of it immediately in the sense of an object that I look at, mm. and I know there's more to the object than what I'm experiencing of it. Mm. But beyond that, there is a sense of the world that goes beyond what, I, what I'm currently experiencing entirely. And I have a thought, exp an experiment, which I mentioned that you're on the ground and I'm up in a tree and I'm pointing to something. Mm. And you have a sense that there's something out there that is very important, that really does exist, but in which is not the moment related to my body. And this sort of opens up a space of possibility. And the space of possibility, of generality, that is really the what I would regard as the everyday transcendence that is built into human consciousness and again is not present in animal consciousness. And you link up your own boyhood and that of Sir Walter Raleigh at the end of the book in, in quite an imaginative way. Can you say a little bit about what was, um, what was going through your mind there? Well, it was just I remember when I was in the first form uh, there was Millet's famous boyhood of Raleigh uh, as a picture on the wall and it showed a stalwart Genoese sailor pointing to the horizon and there's Raleigh with his eyes hanging on stalks, being fed the kind of stories that then drove him to uh, travel over the earth in search rather largely of piratically seized goods. And John Maynard Keynes pointed out that the kind of um, booty that was brought back to the United Kingdom and indeed to Europe created a um, surplus in the treasuries of the nations involved. And that surplus, in a way, created a leisure class who in turn were responsible for inquiry and science, ultimately the Industrial Revolution, which in turn created a sufficient free disposable income to mm. make it possible for us to have free schooling and so on, including the schools that I went to. Mm. And on the wall of that school was indeed Millet's boyhood of Raleigh. Mm. So in a sense, you could think of the Genoese sailors pointing over the horizon eventually to me as a mm. schoolboy, lucky enough to be educated as previous generations hadn't. That's a lot of responsibility for one index finger to bear, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely, yes, guys. Raymond Tallis. Michelangelo's finger is out now in hardback. Full details on ordering can be found on the Blackwell website at blackwell.co.uk.